you can start talking uh, whenever you're ready. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. I, like everyone else, would like to thank the organizers for keeping this going despite the world situation. And also thanks to everybody who's tuning in across the world. A number of the talks in this workshop have involved lines such as, once Lenny Suskin said such and such. So this talk is going to begin with a similar line. Once Adam Brown and Lenny Suskin wrote this paper, which says, let me see if I can clear my screen. There we go. It concerns the construction of a resource, or proposes the construction of a resource theory of complexity in which the relevant thermodynamic resource would be the gap between the complexity of a system and the maximum possible complexity, the uncomplexity. So, as far as I'm aware, such a resource theory for uncomplexity hasn't yet been defined. I did some literature searching over the past week. If anyone is aware of such literature that I'm not aware of, then please feel free to let me know. But resource theories have shown up elsewhere recently in this holographic field, for example, in this paper, and it's a little bit making its way into this field. So what are resource theories? So I'm here today wearing my resource theorist hat. I wear a lot of, res uh, a lot of research hats. Um, most of you I'm familiar with because of um, my work on out-of-time ordered correlators. I am very fond of decomposing them in terms of quasi-probability distributions, which are like probability distributions, but more quantum. But in another of my research lives, I am a resource theorist. So I'd like for us to answer this question. Let's ask a more basic question. What are resources? This question too is a little bit difficult because the notion of a resource is some abstract thing. So let's ask an even simpler question. What are examples of resources? I'd like for everybody to take a few seconds to picture in your mind some things that are resources to you, to your universities, your families, your cities. Here are some of my favorite examples. One is energy. Suppose that we have a lifted weight or a charged battery, then we can turn a mill wheel and create things in a factory. Information is another resource. If I can predict the outcome of a race, then I can win money. But let's go back to our previous question, what are resources? I state that these are things that are valuable, they're useful for performing tasks, and they're scarce. Here's another, uh, or so resources can transform into each other. For example, our resource of information can transform into the capacity to do work if we have a heat bath around. The mechanism for this transformation is called Zillard's engine. If anyone is unfamiliar with it, I highly recommend asking me about it later in the question and answer session. Um, Zillard's engine is a very famous construction in information theoretic thermodynamics, and it's a very useful toy model and way of thinking. But it invites us to ask a broader question. Under what conditions can one resource transform into another? Let's take a cue from Adam and Lenny and think about thermodynamics. We do ask such a question often in conventional thermodynamics. Specifically, we ask, under what condition can one macrostate transform into another spontaneously? We answer this question by identifying the relevant free energy. If and only if it declines monotonically, the transformation can happen spontaneously. But thermodynamics involves restrictions to systems of many particles, to classical systems, and to equilibrium initial and final states. We might not want all of these restrictions if we're quantum information theorists or other quantum theorists. So we need a new toolkit. The resource theory framework offers such a toolkit. I highly recommend this review. Eric and Gilad know the field extremely well. Now let's step back to our original question. What are resource theories? The resource theories are simple models developed in quantum information theory for situations in which practicalities limit the operations you can perform and the systems that you can access. Over the past 10 years, the resource theory literature has exploded. People have defined resource theories for all sorts of things. Entanglement, thermodynamics, coherence, randomness. Later in the week, I think we are going to hear from Brian Swingle about a resource theory for magic state distillation, which involves a computational resource. So that's what we're going to talk about in this talk. 
specifically, I'm going to focus on the framework of resource theories for thermodynamics for two reasons. One, a special case of this resource theory is the resource theory for information processing, because really information processing is thermodynamics at zero energy. And this resource theory for information processing has a lot in it that we would want in a resource theory for uncomplexity. Besides, black holes are thermal, Hawking radiation is thermal, we're all interested in thermodynamics. Then I'm going to illustrate what we can do with a resource theory with three examples. I'll show a geometric way of completely characterizing a system's resourcefulness in thermodynamics. I'll show a generalization of the second law of thermodynamics for small scales rather than many, many particles. And I'll show how to quantify the optimal efficiencies with which we can perform operational tasks, the information analogs of extracting work and expending work. Then we were invited to present some provocative theses, so I'll give that a shot. Let's start with the framework of resource theories for thermodynamics. I'll introduce them through this table. There are a number of classes of resource theories for thermodynamics. I'll list those in the columns of this table. And each of the rows will correspond to one of the key, resource, one of the key features of a resource theory. So we'll fill in the table while getting to know our thermodynamic resource theories. The simplest thermodynamic resource theory is called the resource theory for non-uniformity. The reason for that funny name will become clear shortly. This models information processing, which I said is really just thermodynamics at zero energy, or more precisely, thermodynamics in which all of the relevant parts of the extensive observables, such as the Hamiltonian, are totally degenerate. A generalization consists of the resource theory for athermality. This models exchanges of heat. And the most general class consists of resource theories of non-equilibrium. These model exchanges of arbitrary thermodynamic quantities, so energy, particles, electric charge, volume, and so on. And this class subsumes the other two columns. But what is in a resource theory? What are the basic features? We often have in mind some agent, some experimentalist who has certain tools. And we call these tools free systems. These are the systems that are easily available under the practical constraints. So that will form the first row in our table. Before we can specify the free systems in the resource theory for non-uniformity, we have to specify just how we are going to model systems, period, in the resource theory of non-uniformity. We'll get there by the following reasoning. So, the resource theory of non-uniformity models information processing. What is valuable in information processing? Information. What is information? It's an ability to predict outcomes of measurements. There are some other definitions for information, but I'm not going to get philosophical about that right now. So we'll model systems as probability distributions or quantum states. Because suppose that we make a measurement, there are d possible outcomes. Our prior a probability distribution with d elements quantifies our ability to predict the outcome of the measurement. And quantum states for rho can be represented by matrices. I'm going to use the quantum information theoretic meaning of state or quantum state. So when I say state or quantum state, I might be referring to a pure state. I might be referring to a mixed state. They are all states. They are all representable by matrices. We can rep represent a quantum state in particular with a matrix that is diagonal relative to its own eigenbasis. The diagonal elements are probabilities, the probabilities of the possible outcomes of a measurement of that eigenbasis. In the resource theory for non-uniformity, the free systems or worthless systems, the valuable or worthless systems that are very easily available, it doesn't cost anything to get one of them, are the uniform distributions. Because if your prior distribution is uniform, you have absolutely no idea what outcome will obtain. You have no information. The quantum aversion of that is proportional to the identity matrix. How do we model systems in the resource theory for athermality? This resource theory, as I said, models exchanges of heat. Let's, for inspiration, turn back to conventional thermodynamics. There, if systems can exchange just heat with the bath, the relevant free energy is the Helmholtz free energy. It is the relevant thermodynamic resource, it has these two terms. One corresponds to information, one corresponds to energy. So let's encapsulate the idea of information in a quantum state row. If 
we have a state row, then we can calculate all sorts of measures of our information about possible outcomes of measurements. Let's map the energy to a Hamiltonian. So in this resource theory, we will model systems with tuples rho comma h defined on the same Hilbert space. What about free systems? We think about an agent who is in an environment at a fixed temperature, T. We imagine that that agent can pick a Hamiltonian, any Hamiltonian, let's call it H sub B, and draw from the bath a system governed by that Hamiltonian and at thermal equilibrium relative to that Hamiltonian and the environmental temperature. If the Hamiltonian is totally degenerate, then this Gibbs state reduces to the non-uniform state in. So again, the resource theory for athermality reduces to the resource theory for non-uniformity information processing. So here are free systems in the resource theory for athermality. In the resource theory for non-equilibrium, we generalize straightforwardly. So the agent can draw from the bath any system at equilibrium relative to the intensive parameters of the bath, such as temperature and chemical potential. And by the way, these quantities, um, so here in our representation of the system, we have observables that represent the quantities that are exchanged with a bath, such as particle number and electric charge and so on. And these quantities needn't commute with each other. Almost always when we do thermodynamics, we implicitly assume that these quantities do commute with each other. But a few years ago, this resource theory framework um, invited some of us to realize that we are making this commutation assumption for no good reason. Um, and we should be thinking about other observables that don't commute with each other. This is an opportunity for truly quantum thermodynamics. This is something I'll talk about a little bit more later. Let's go back to our general features of a resource theory. We said that we have an agent who has certain tools called free systems. That agent also has certain skills. We call those free operations. They're the ones that are easy to perform. So that forms the next row in our table. In the resource theory for non-uniformity, we said the ability to predict is valuable, so information is valuable. In that case, it is all too easy to add noise. Our free operations are called noisy operations. They have the following mathematical form. Suppose that we start off with a state row, then we can tensor on any uniform free worthless distribution. We can transform the joint system with any unitary, and then we can trace out any ancilla A. So this, as far as state transformations are concerned, this quantum resource theory is equivalent to the classical version. So I've been talking about quantum states, so I might as well talk about probability distributions instead of unitaries, permutations, and instead of partial traces, marginalizations. How come? Because all the unitaries are free. So suppose that we started off with a density matrix that had coherences off diagonal elements. Then for free, we could perform the unitary that diagonalizes that matrix. So our matrix that has coherences within it, with it, or excuse me, that has coherences in it, is operationally equivalent to a diagonal density matrix, which is just a probability distribution. So we might as well just talk about the classical case. I will sometimes use quantum notation because it can be cleaner and easily recognizable. So noisy operations go in our first box. In the resource theory for athermality, we have thermal operations. In fact, by now, a number of variations on thermal operations have been defined, but thermal operations are pretty simple. I think they were the original operations, so I'll stick with those for now. These generalize noisy operations. So we start off with a tuple, rho comma h, and we can tensor on a thermal state, pick out a piece of bath and bring it over to the system of interest. We can couple it to with any unitary that conserves the ham total Hamiltonian, by which I mean the Hamiltonian of the system plus the Hamiltonian of the bath. The interaction Hamiltonian is what's generating the unitary. Then we can, oh, this energy conservation is the manifestation in the resource theory of the first law of thermodynamics. Then we can throw away any subsystem A that's not coupled to the rest of the system through the Hamiltonian. The state transforms like this, the Hamiltonian transforms like this. We filled in the next box. In the resource theories for non-equilibrium, the free operations are called equilibrating operations. They generalize thermal operations. 
Now we begin with a whole list of our density operator, our Hamiltonian, and the observables that represent the other quantities exchanged with the bath. We can pick up a piece of the bath and bring it over to the system. Now our unitary has to conserve all the globally conserved quantities. And we can trace out a subsystem A. So the state transforms like this, the Hamiltonian transforms like this, and the other extensive observables transform analogously. We've finished that row. So in our resource theory, we have an agent who has certain tools and certain skills, but lacks other tools. These are called resources that may be valuable for operational tasks. In the resource theory for non-uniformity, non-uniform states or distributions are valuable. For example, a particularly valuable state is a pure state. If our prior is a pure distribution, then there exists a measurement we can perform such that we can predict the outcome exactly. We have perfect information about that measurement. In the resource theory for athermality, systems not at thermal equilibrium relative to the ambient temperature are resources. What is a simple physical reason for thinking so? A simple example from undergraduate thermodynamics class. Suppose that we have access to a heat bath at a temperature T sub H, and suddenly we're given a much colder system. We can let heat flow from one to the other, and from the heat flow we can extract work. Work is valuable, for instance, we can use it to power our cars. So it makes sense to think that this system that's not at thermal equilibrium relative to the ambient temperature is a resource. And in the resource theories for non-equilibrium, states not at equilibrium relative to the intensive parameters of the environment are resources. Here are some references for those who would like to look up these resource theories. The resource theory for non-uniformity has its roots in the 1970s. Actually, some chemists figured out the basics, even though they weren't using the language of resource theories. The resource theory was defined in 2003 by a whole lot of Horodetskys and a few other people. Uh, a few years ago, I, together with co-authors, wrote a very thorough review on this resource theory. So it is very long, but it is very pedagogical. So hopefully it's helpful if you would like to um, get your foot into the resource theory framework. The resource theory for athermality has its roots in the 1990s. It was formally defined in this paper. This paper contains a lot of the first most important results. Loads of papers have been written about this resource theory. I'll point out just one that I wrote because it was written for people who are not in resource theories, but are interested in resource theories. Um, it explains the resource theory for athermality and opportunities and challenges in taking this resource theory outside of its niche of quantum information theory into the rest of physics. In resource theories for non-equilibrium, I defined with Joe Renes and generalized. And these papers are about these resource theories for uh, exchanges of quantities that don't commute with each other, the truly quantum thermodynamics problem. But what can we do with a resource theory? Here are some example results. I'll talk about a generalization of the second law of thermodynamics, a geometric way of completely characterizing the resourcefulness of a system in thermodynamics, and the optimal efficiencies with which we can perform some information processing tasks analogous to the expenditure and extraction of work. How do we think of the second law of thermodynamics in conventional thermodynamics? Often we'll have a problem like the following. We will have some initial macro state, for instance, that in which a bunch of particles are clumped up together in one corner of a box. We'll have in mind a final macro state, for instance, that in which the particles are spread evenly across the box. And we'll ask, can the system transition from one state to the other spontaneously? To answer this question, we identify the relevant free energy. If heat and particles can be exchanged between system and bath, the relevant free energy is the grand potential. If and only if the free energy declines monotonically, the transition can happen spontaneously. But as I said before, when we tell the story, we implicitly have in mind very, very large systems, averaging over particles, and equilibrium initial and final states we might want to back away from these assumptions. But let's restate the problem in the context of the resource theory. Now we'll have in mind some system, rho, h, n, and so on, and some final system, sigma, h prime, n prime, and so on. Now our question is, 
does there exist any free operation that maps one system to the other? So our question is a more general question, so we have to do more mathematical legwork. Instead of checking just one inequality, we have to check a whole family of inequalities. These could be called second laws. So how do we check whether one system can transform into another for free? I'm gonna make a few simplifying assumptions. One is that the extents of observables remain constants. This is very easy to eliminate as an assumption. I'll also assume that the state's flat coherences relative to our favorite bases are re represented by matrices that are just diagonal. These diagonal elements, again, are probabilities of the possible outcomes of a measurement of this basis. This assumption was lifted a few years ago in um, a great paper that I did not co-write, but I very much admire, uh, answered a big open question. The mathematical toolkit behind what I'm going to present is called dematerization. Dematerization basically answers the question, how far is a given probability distribution from some fixed vector D? In our case, the relevant vector is the worthless distribution, the equilibrium distribution, because we wanna know how much value our system has and so how different our probability vector is from the equilibrium vector. Recall again that if we're dealing with just information processing, the resource theory for non-uniformity, then the equilibrium re distribution reduces to the uniform distribution. If you're interested in references, I recommend these two. Marshall Olkin and Arnold wrote a very detailed, very thorough textbook. And our review on the resource theory of non-uniformity presents a lot of the basics about dematerization from a quantum information theoretic perspective. In order to be able to compare the value of two systems to see whether one can transform into another for free, we should be able to characterize how much resourcefulness one of these systems has. We can do that geometrically by following the following um, protocol. We take each diagonal element of that density matrix, each probability R sub K, and we rescale it with an inverse Boltzmann type factor. So this R sub K is a probability. It tells us about our ability to predict the outcome of measurement. So it encodes an informational resource. This exponential encodes an energetic resource and a particle res number resource and so on. So this rescaled quantity on the right-hand side is encodes resourcefulness of all different types in this thermodynamic problem. This rescaling is not necessary in the resource theory of non-uniformity because there, all of the extensive observables are totally degenerate, so all of these exponentials equal each other. Then we order the rescaled probabilities from greatest to least, and we plot partial sums in the following way. I'm gonna show you a complicated picture, but we're gonna break it down into very simple pieces. First, I want for you to focus on the x-axis. I've drawn a number of tick marks. One tick mark is at the origin. To get to the next, next tick mark, you add the first Boltzmann factor. To get to the next tick mark, you add the next Boltzmann type factor, and so on until you've added all the Boltzmann factors and gotten the partition function. Each of these tick marks is going to be associated with a point. We get the y-coordinates of the points as follows. The one point lies at the origin. To get to the next point, we add the first eigenvalue. To get to the next point, we add the next eigenvalue. By eigenvalue, I mean probability, eigenvalue of the density matrix, and so on until we've added all of the eigenvalues and gotten one. We plot these points, we connect them with straight lines, and voila, we have a rescaled Lorenz curve, which is a complete geometric characterization of the thermodynamic resourcefulness of a state. I'll show you through some examples of how this illustrates resourcefulness. First, I want to point out that if we're dealing with the resource theory of non-uniformity, then so we're just dealing with information processing, then we didn't need to do any rescaling, and the rescaled Lorenz curve becomes just a plain old Lorenz curve. So here are some examples. The least valuable states, every worthless state, every free state is represented by a straight line. We can easily see why by thinking about the resource theory for non-uniformity. Here, uniform distributions are the free states, the worthless states. In a uniform distribution, as you go along the y-axis, adding probabilities onto each other, suppose that the state has dimensionality d. Then you keep adding one over d plus one over d plus one over d. So the tick marks are evenly spaced. So our line has to be a straight line. 
from the origin all the way up to the far right hand corner. So this diagonal line is the least valuable state. A uh, very valuable state is a pure state. It goes straight upward and then horizontally. So it is very, very different from the diagonal line. It bows outward a lot from the diagonal line. And the more that a state's curve bows outward from the diagonal line, the more value this state has. To completely characterize the difference between a given Lorenz curve or rescaled Lorenz curve and the diagonal line, we have to use the set of all of these rescaled Boltzmann factors. There is no one measure to rule them all. Um, you have to use the entire set for a complete characterization. Um, so these measures of the difference between a, a given rescaled Lorenz curve and that straight worthless diagonal line, um, those measures decline monotonically under free operations, um, just as free energies decline monotonically under thermalization. So we call these measures monotones. There's no one monotone to rule them all that tells you everything you need to know about the resourcefulness of a state. But if you're interested in particular operational tasks, then different monotones will quantify the optimal efficiencies with which you can perform these tasks. And some of the parts of the curve quantify the optimal efficiencies with which we can perform different tasks. So we have a complete characterization of the resourcefulness of a system in thermodynamics. How do we check now whether one system can transform into another via, therm via free operations? We plot the, same, the two states curves on the same plot, and then we use this theorem. It states that there exists a free operation that turns one system into another, if and only if the row curve lies everywhere above or on the sigma curve. In the example I've drawn here, yes, the row curve lies everywhere above or on the sigma curve. So yes, there exists a free operation that transforms one system into the other. I did say everywhere. So this statement implicitly encodes a whole bunch of inequalities, which we can think of as second laws for thermodynamics. If you are interested in a proof sketch, I can give one later. But what did we do and what did we not do? We didn't assume that the system is thermodynamically large or has many, many particles. We didn't average over particles or trials. We didn't assume that the initial system and the final system were at equilibrium. So our problem was relatively general, and so the transformation law was relatively complicated in a sense, in that it consists of multiple inequalities, not just one. Now, we started out... You did assume the density matrices commute, did you not? I did, assume, I did assume that because what I presented were transformation laws specifically for the diagonals of the density matrix. Um, I mentioned earlier that there was a paper a few years ago that answered a big open problem in the field, and that was a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for the entire state to transform. So diagonal, um, diagonal elements plus coherences. If you're interested in that, I can um, give you a reference for it later. Um, often in resource theories, what happens is we, particularly thermodynamic resource theories, is we start off with a quasi-classical problem, thinking about the diagonal, and once we get that under control, we deal with the off-diagonal elements. So here I'm dealing with the quasi-classical problem, but you can do more. Okay. So we used a, so we established a complete geometric characterization of our thermodynamic system. Um, using that, we found a criterion under which one system can transform into the other. Now we're going to use that trans, that, that transformation criterion to go back to our geometric representation and learn more about it. We're going to see how parts of the curve quantify the optimal efficiencies with which we can perform operational tasks. So, or we're going to talk about the anatomy of a Lorenz curve. I'm going to focus on the Lorenz curve, focusing on the resource theory of non-uniformity because it's simplest. So I'm, here's an example curve. Um, really, these uh, points should be evenly spaced along the x-axis, but um, you could actually you know, define the state such that this still works. Um, I've also rescaled the x-axis so that my Lorenz curve at, ends at x equals 1. This first part of the curve 
that goes straight after beginning at the origin, I dub the on-ramp. So the on-ramp has a slope whose log equals the minimum non-uniformity cost of creating the state of interest. You can think of the minimum, or you can think of the non-uniformity cost as the informational analog of the work required to compress a gas in the following way. Um, so look at this state, or look at um, this curve picked out in green dashes. Um, that represents a particular state. And this green dashed curve lies everywhere above or on the black curve that represents the system of interest. Therefore, by the theorem that we just saw, if you have this green dashed curve, then via free operations, you can transform it into the desired state row. Um, so this green dashed curve represents a state with the minimal non-uniformity required to create row. Let me tell you a little more about this green dashed curve. It uh, belongs to a family of states called sharp states, at least we call them sharp states in our review on the resource theory of non-uniformity. You can think of the sharp states as gold coins of non-uniformity or standard units of non-uniformity. A sharp state has this probability distribution. So the first d sub u entries are non-zero, they're all equal to one over du, and the final entries are zeros. You can think physically about the distribution as follows. Imagine that you have a particle in a box, a very simple model for an ideal gas in a box. And the box has D subcompartments that all have the same volume. We know that the particle is somewhere in the first D sub U subcompartments. Knowing that, we could stick a piston into the box, allow the gas to expand against, against the piston and extract work. And we can calculate just how much work we would extract. So in that sense, a sharp state, um, or I should add, uh, we can extract that work if we take our particle and box and hook it up to a heat bath. Um, so in this, state, in this uh, manner, a sharp state um, is a, a, a standard unit, basically, for non-uniformity. A special state, or a special case of a sharp state is a pure state. Um, it is a sharp state in which d sub u equals one, so we know exactly which subcompartment the particle is. And that corresponds to a Lorenz curve that shoots upward even more quickly than the sharp state that I drew before. Because if we have a particle that's localized in one subcompartment, we can expand that particle all the way out to the end of the total box. Um, whereas if we had just this sharp state up above, then we can expand the particle out less so we can recover less work. So the pure state is more valuable than this sharp state. The value or non-uniformity of a sharp state, here we go, um, we quantify with the log of the dimensionality of the whole state over d sub u. So if d sub u is very small, like in the case of the pure state, the d over d sub u is very large, and the non-uniformity is large, or the value of the state is large, which we saw through the example that I talked about before. Uh, so we're gonna have a basic question? Yes. So basically, you, I, th I think you said that this uh, sharp state is the minimal, uh, let's say minimally non-uniform state with which you can create. So I'm a bit confused Let's because it seems that the, the one that the, the, the black curve is more uniform. So this minimal non-uniformity is different. So let's put it this way. Um, suppose that we want to uh, quantify the non-uniformity required to perform a task. Then we have to agree on sort of units of non-uniformity. So suppose that I do that in the following way. I say that um, in any operational task, um, my, oh, or suppose that I want to create the state row, um, I need to start out, uh, suppose that I start, start out with a sharp state. What is the minimal non-uniformity of any sharp state that is required to create row? And I then see, later okay, we're okay. At, yeah, exactly. So, so, you, so, you limit, so you limit to the standard and, and then given this, this particular standard, then it's the minimal cost that you have. Right. And before we introduce sharp states, as far as I know, the standard that had been used was pure states, um, which is okay as well. Just sharp states are 
um, more flexible, so they in include pure states. Um, you. Or if you wanted, you could use as your standard qubits. Um, so that would limit you a little bit more because depending on, you might need some fractional number of qubits, might, which might be a little awkward, but you could still do it. Um, this is just the, the standard that we chose. Okay, so the minimal non-uniformity of any sharp state that you can use to create row um, is this, the log of the dimensionality of the system plus the log of the greatest eigenvalue of the state. Some of you might recognize this final term as the negative of the order infinity Rennie entropy, and this whole thing as the order infinity Rennie divergence between the state and the maximally mixed state. If you are not familiar with the Rennie entropies or the Rennie divergences, don't worry about this. Uh, you can regard this as sort of a definition. Well, this final horizontal part of the state I call the tail. And the log of its length is the maximum non-uniformity of any sharp state that you can extract from rho. For instance, look at this sharp state, Lorenz curve. It lies everywhere below or on the rho curve. So if you have rho, then you can transform it into this sharp state via free operations. You can extract the sharp state from it. And that maximum non-uniformity is the log of the dimensionality of the system minus the log of the dimensionality of the support of rho. Uh, some of you will recognize this final term as the order zero Rennie entropy and the whole thing as the order zero Rennie divergence between the state and the maximally mixed states. Again, if you don't know those terms, don't worry about them. So we found that two different operational tasks, work expenditure and work extraction, are, have optimal efficiencies quantified by different entropies. So the minimum non-uniformity of creation doesn't have to equal the maximum non-uniformity extractable. This scenario contrasts with the ordinary thermodynamic scenario. Suppose that we have an ideal gas in a box and we want to compress it to a certain volume. The optimal cost comes from quasi-static compression. Now, suppose that we have that compressed gas and we want to expand it. The most work that we can extract comes from quasi-static um, expansion. And those two optimal work quantities equal each other. But again, we're not dealing with many particles or equilibrium states. We're dealing with single shots. In this scenario, the two different work quantities need not equal each other. However, we can take the resource theory results, take averages, take a large system limit, and recover results that are reminiscent of ordinary con conventional thermodynamics. So suppose that we take the, or suppose that we calculate the work cost of creating many copies n of our state. We average over the copies, and then we take the limit as the number of copies approaches infinity. We can do the same thing to the work extractable. Excuse me, just now when I said work, I meant non-uniformity, non-uniformity cost and non-uniformity extractable. Both of these quantities come to equal the relative entropy or kullback liebler divergence between the states and the maximally mixed distribution, which happens to equal the log of the dimensionality of the system minus the von Neumann entropy of the state. So these two quantities do come to equal each other on average over many copies. And by the way, if you work out what this equals, um, this expression does equal the expression that you would expect from ordinary statistical mechanics. It has the form of a free energy difference. We were asked to, at the end of our talks, stand on a soapbox and basically pontificate about some uh, controversial theses. So, um, here. Uh, just one question. Yes. Uh, that uh, just wanted to, to verify. Did you mention the kullback liebler divergence just now? I did. Oh, okay. That that's this D, right? Yeah. Right. So uh, I had a question uh, at the beginning of your talk because I I wanted to ask this uh, same thing that if you want to compare the distance between two different probability distributions. Um, why do you need to do all this majorization? Why can't you just use uh, the kullback liebler uh, divergence? The kullback liebler divergence is one way of quantifying the difference between two probability distributions, but you might be interested, but um, there, are, let's see, 
Um, suppose that we define more, gen or we ask more generally, what is the sets of all functions that quantify the difference between some probability distribution and the uniform distribution? What is the set of all of those functions? There are infinitely many such functions. Um, the kolbeck liebler divergence is only one of those functions. And if we're thinking about a particular operational task whose optimal efficiency happens to be the kolbeck liebler divergence, then that is a great measure to use. But we looked at some other operational tasks in which other, others of these functions um, quantify the optimal efficiencies. In these cases, we would want to use those. And um, one such question, or one related task is figuring out whether, in general, under these free operations, one probability distribution can transform into another. And to answer that question, we have to check a whole set, a complete set of these functions. Meteorization is, is, is like a general way to do that for arbitrary functions. Right, for, so I suppose that we're talking about um, these probability distributions, then um, I showed a theorem earlier. Um, now, it, this might take a little bit longer to explain, so let me come back to it after. So, some statements that could uh, stimulate some discussion include, um, suppose that we're looking for a resource theory of uncomplexity. I conjecture that it would be equivalent to a variation on the resource theory of non-uniformity that's a little bit more restricted than the resource theory of non-uniformity. Um, also, I am interested in these conserved quantities that can be exchanged between system and bath that don't commute with each other, that make for a particularly quantum thermodynamics. Um, so this idea was introduced in quantum information theory and it's been propagating across quantum information theoretic thermodynamics. Um, very recently, it started getting into atomic molecular and optical physics and condensed matter physics, but I'm very interested in what implications it could have in high energy physics, since, especially since this community thinks a lot about thermodynamics, including in the context of conserved charges what happens if they don't commute with each other. In summary, we looked at what resource theories as a whole are. We saw some more detail about the framework of resource theories for thermodynamics. We saw three example results. First, a geometric way of completely characterizing the thermodynamic resourcefulness of a system. Second, a generalization of the second law of thermodynamics. And third, optimal efficiencies with which we can perform operational tasks analogous to work expenditure and work extraction. And saw that there are opportunities for more thought. So thanks for your time. So let's thank Nico then for the great talk. Uh, so we got a uh, good amount of time actually for discussion. So Again, we do the same we've been doing. So if you don't trust your connection and you want me to read a question, you can send it in the Zoom chat. Or of course, you can just unmute yourself and ask Nicole a question. Okay, there was this question about majorization. Would you mind restating the question? Right, so um, initially I was thinking that, well, I mean, you want to quantify the distance between two different probability distributions, right? And so the first thing that comes to mind is the mutual information, right? The pullback liberal divergence. And then, so that's what I asked you. And then you said that, no, you want a whole family of possible functions because, um, you know, the, depending on the task at hand, a uh, different function might, might quantify the um, efficiency of the process, right? And so then I, then I asked that, well, so majorization is a more general form of, uh, of this, uh, of finding a distance between two probability distributions. That was my question, I guess. Okay, let me go back to an earlier slide and then afterward I'll share my screen again. <laughs> 
Okay, so you can show that. Um, oh, first, let me give a little bit of context reinstatement. We were talking about the conditions under which one state can turn into another for free. Um, suppose that we're just focusing on the simple case of the resource theory of non-uniformity, so for free under noisy operations. We said that this can happen if and only if the rho Lorentz curve lies everywhere above or on the sigma curve. We can show that the second condition, the rho curve lies everywhere above or on the sigma curve, is equivalent to the statement rho majorizes sorry, sigma. Nicole, sorry to interrupt, but again, uh, what does it mean when you say for free? That there exists a free operation, in this case, a noisy operation, that transforms rho into sigma. Okay. Does it mean the following? You take a certain number, if it's, you think of it quantum mechanically, of qubits in the bath, which are in a totally rent, maximally mixed state, and you combine them with your system, apply some unitary, and then forget the bath again. And you're asking whether the outcome of that can be um, the desired state? Um, Basically. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a small technicality, you can um, partially trace out any subsystem you want. Um, but yeah, if we want to keep the state space constant over the map, then yeah, we would probably want to trace out just the bath qubits that we added on. But yeah, that's the right idea. Thanks. So next, I think we, we got a question here in the chat uh, from Abhinav uh, Deshpande. And he's asking uh, if you could give the promised proof sketch of the result you stated and also said, thanks for the great talk. Great. Oh, thanks. Good to hear from you, Avinov. Let me go to the right slide and then share my screen again. Okay, here is the proof sketch that comes from these two papers. We can think, again, more generally in terms of the resource theories for non-equilibrium, which model exchanges of arbitrary thermodynamic quantities between system and bath. So first, we defined a quasi-order or a pre-order on the set of systems in our resource theory. So let me start with the second half of that sentence. Let me take the systems in our resource theory and denote them by capital Latin letters. Now, let's go to the beginning of that sentence. It contains the words quasi-order and pre-order. What is a quasi-order? It is a binary relationship defined on a set, and it's denoted by this symbol. It has two defining properties. First, this relationship is reflexive, so every system or every element of this set is at least as great as itself in the quasi-order. And second, the quasi-order is transitive. So if R is at, lies above S and S lies above T, then R lies above T. Well, that's what a quasi-order is. So we defined a particular quasi-order in terms of certain stochastic matrices. So we took stochastic matrices that map equilibrium distributions to equilibrium distributions. And we said, if um, you can take R, you can multiply it by one of these stochastic matrices, and you get S, then R lies above S in this quasi-order. That's how we defined it. And we proved that R lying above S in the quasi-order is equivalent to the existence of an equilibrating operation that maps R to S, which kind of makes sense, because you should think of a stochastic matrix as something that is likely to um, probably be a good model of equilibration. Then we used properties of stochastic matrices to prove that this rescaled Lorenz curve completely characterizes the quasi-order, which I basically hinted at in um, my response to Deepak's question. That implies that these two curves alone reveal whether there exists an equilibrating operation that maps R to S. 
um, this result was kind of comforting because it could have been the case that different types of thermodynamic resources, like um, one system could have a lot of energy, another system could have a lot of particles. Uh, these types of thermodynamic resources might not have been interconvertible, but um, since there's just one quasi order for the whole resource theory, um, they are interconvertible. Uh, for instance, there is the resource theory of multi-partite entanglements that has sort of islands of different types of entanglements. W states and GHC states are not interconvertible via the free operations, local operations, and classical communication. Um, but this showed that the thermodynamic resources of these different types are interconvertible. Interesting, thanks. So yeah, Nico, also we got a question from Philip Feist on the chat. And he's asking if you could share insight on how a resource theory of complexity would look like if you, if you know how that could, could be. And as an example, he also said, do you think it could be phrased in terms of some notion of majorization? Yeah, also great to hear from you, Philippe. Um, yeah, so I, I guess this is where it gets a little difficult to be having the workshop online um, because this is where I've just been thinking and uh, haven't completely worked it out. Um, but yeah, so I, I expect that there could be a resource theory of complexity that is um, sort of isomorphic to, as I said, a restricted version of the resource theory of non-uniformity. In the resource theory of non-uniformity, um, you can uh, tensor on arbitrary non-uniform states to your system. Um, I think there might be a restriction on which non-uniform, excuse me, you could tensor on uniform states. Um, I think there might be a restriction in the dimensionality of the states that you could tensor on. Um, and so one of the things is, in Adam and Lenny's paper, they think about a quantum system that's growing more and more complex as it's evolving under some interesting Hamiltonian in time. And they compare that to a classical system A. And they say that the complexity of the quantum system grows as the entropy of the classical system. Um, so I think that we could define a resource theory of uncomplexity um, that would act like the model for the quantum system Q. And meanwhile, the resource theory of non-uniformity would be like the model for the classical system A. Um, and some of the quantitative statements that they put forth in that paper have some resonance with some of the monotones in the resource theory for non-uniformity. Um, and yeah, so the free operations and free states um, I think could be guessed that um, at the moment I'm looking into monotone, so I, I'd be happy to chat about this later. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, thanks for the question. Any more questions from people? Uh, this might be a little bit a simple one. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I was thinking about uh, like the reusability of the resource. So if I have a resource with a high value, like the in the uniform case, I have a resource which is one zero 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 in the uh, non-uniformity resource. Uh, can I like use a process which would decrease the purity of this resource or like the value of this resource and then add on a process to it which would keep on using it? So it sounds like you're asking, suppose you have a really valuable resource, then yeah. can you use it up slowly? Yeah. 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 Um, you just choose the right free operation so that, mm -hmm. um, and um, y you can even, um, one can come up with examples. Um, and if you're interested, then feel free to email me afterward. I could point you to a specific location in our paper on the resource theory of non-uniformity that has examples. Um, there are some, uh, so every, um, every one of the noisy operations can be decomposed into very basic steps called T transforms. Okay. And a T transform basically takes one little piece of the Lorentz curve and brings it down. 
Okay. So you could imagine performing an arbitrary noisy operation by performing T transform after T transform and after T transform. Yeah. And each one brings the uh, resourcefulness of the state down a little bit. Yeah. So there was another one on the same lines. So if I use a resource and I do something with it, can I reverse this entire process or there is no restriction on that? Can I reverse this entire process and get the resource back? There are a few different cases. So suppose that, um, again, for simplicity, we're talking about just the resource theory for non-uniformity. Suppose that all you do is a unitary. Um, so you tensor on a trivial state, um, yeah. you perform a, a non-trivial unitary, and then you trace out a trivial subsystem with no non-trivial dimensionality. Um, you can just undo that unitary. But suppose that you perform a free operation that brings the Lorenz curve downward. That you cannot undo unless someone gives you a resource from elsewhere. Maybe you yeah. have a, a friend from with a non-uniformity bank makes you a loan. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, those were two simple questions I had in mind. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I think the, the other question in the chat from the username Jayla Dubildan, what, what role time is playing here? And if it's important, the time scales that things happen. Yeah, there are a, couple, a, a few angles um, to the answer on this question. Um, the, the free operations in the resource theories for thermodynamics are, in a sense, intended to model thermalization and thermalization happens over some time scale but there is no obvious role for time in the resource theory um, you could count the number of free operations you perform uh, an alternative is you could create a quantum clock or quantum switch so suppose that time is important to us because um, at this period of time uh, for a time interval t1 a Hamiltonian H1 should be evolving our system of interest. And afterwards, um, starting at time T2, a Hamiltonian H2 should be evolving our system of interest. For instance, maybe our system of interest is going through a quantum circuit. And at this time, this gate needs to be evolving it. At that time, that gate needs to be evolving it. Then we can create a switch. So some, there's some ancilla system. It would be a lot easier if I could write on a whiteboard. Unfortunately, I don't have an iPad, um, but I could point you to some references. Um, so you can use this switch as a sort of clock. So when the switch is in the state one, then it causes the Hamiltonian H1 to be evolving the system of interest. When then um, an operation happens, the switch moves to state two, and it's being in state two causes the Hamiltonian H2 to be evolving the system of interest. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I should add there, there is a lot of resource theory literature on quantum clocks. I have an extra question for you. Um, you, you mentioned the paper of Fanny where he maps the complexities to the entropy of larger classical system, right? Um, and I was wondering, well, well, maybe it's there uh, in the paper though, um, but uh, how do the different laws of thermodynamic map, uh, and in, if you have thought about that, and in particular, I don't know, something like the third law, like, uh, you know, what happens when I approach zero temperature, what is the temperature map to on the complexity side, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So there, is, uh, there was a paper um, in the resource theory framework written a few years ago by Jonathan Oppenheim and a co-author about the third law of thermodynamics. Also, the zeroth law of thermodynamics a few of us have written about. Um, so those have sort of information theoretic manifestations in the resource theory framework. Um, I agree that it would be interesting to take those on the one hand, suppose that we can get this resource theory for uncomplexity. Um, take that and take on the other hand the paper by um, Adam and Lenny and um, uh, formulate, say, a resource theoretic version of um, 
various thermodynamic or the complexity versions of various thermodynamic laws. I do think that would be interesting. Um, there are probably a number, a number of steps we have to fill in first. Um, but yeah, I think that would be an interesting goal. So I would say maybe uh, this is a good time for us to take another quick break and then we can resume uh, as I understand uh, so we can ask more questions and just have some general discussions. Uh, so let's say five minutes uh, we come back uh, for whoever wants to ask more questions or have discussions. That's good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole, for the talk. <laughs>